morning already. Both morning and noon and evening for some people as well. So welcome to Unicorn, to our seminar on energy economics that today is devoted to US contemporary energy and environmental agenda. And on behalf of the university, I would like to welcome you to welcome you here. Uh, yes, and I would like to say a couple of words. So instead of telling you who we are and why we are, I think most of you know who we are and, and why we are here, I would like to remind you that we are, uh, we have this seminar on the way to our traditional conference, Energetica 21, which will take place in mid-November. We especially moved conference one week before, not to, uh, well, to, held it in, uh, to hold it in the same day as Thanksgiving in America. So uh, we hope that our uh, friends from the United States will be able to join this year. And the topic of incoming conference would be Russia and Global Net Zero. Those who saw me before know that traditionally when I'm speaking about en energies, contemporary energy, I show this, this trolley bus. I say like energy is like trolley bus, it's moving forward. It's all electric, but unfortunately not carbon free. Evolutionary rather than revolutionary. And it has its limits like, like trolley bus. And of course, the topic of uh, global net zero, when all countries announce their very ambitious plans to be, to be net zero soon, uh, will set some challenges in front of us. So we are going to discuss these topics at the conference, if we can move with my slides. Next slide, please. Yes. Yes, we will have a uh, pre-conference again uh, before the, the main day of the conference on 18th of November. We will discuss renewables and uh, reliability, first of all, of decarbonization. And on the main day, we will have three parallel sessions on hydrogen, on national ambitions and pathways to net zero, and also the uh, possibility of the gas industry to survive. What is the, the best outcome for, for the gas industry? And the second day of the conference is traditionally uh, about discussions. We will have a, a well, geopolitical discussion with Peter, Peter Noor. And uh, Friday for Future, this is Young Researchers Seminar, which is traditionally led by James Ball. Next slide, please. Yes, those who never been at the conference, uh, remember, it is held in Marriott Hotel in the heart of St. Petersburg, in the center of St. Petersburg. We hope it will be offline, but taking into account current situation and new principles of, uh, of our world, we expect hybrid model as well. So I think many speakers will be off, uh, online. Next slide, please. Yes. So as I said, it will be mainly offline, but with hybrid opportunities. It is in English and Russian and, and uh, is in, translated and interpreted, whatever you like. It is free of charge, one of the a few conferences that are still free of charge. And, and to register, just remember to write us your wish to, to, uh, uh, to participate. We will launch new web page for Energetica uh, early next week. So we will send you links so you'll be able to register and keep a track on what we are doing. Next slide, please. Yes, I think this is this is what, what we love in Energetica is people having fun. Yes, well, I welcome you all to have fun with James Ball here and uh, Manfred Hafner. Uh, and now I, I would like to welcome all of you here again and give a floor to Marc-Antoine Ilmazega from IFRI. Please, Marc-Antoine, you are a chair. Please do your job. Yes, hello everyone. Um, very, very pleased to be uh, with you virtually this afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Dimitri, for your very kind uh, introductory words. And of course, we very much look forward to visiting, uh, of course, St. Petersburg as soon as possible again. And in, indeed, enjoying the, the kind of personal, uh, friendly relations that we build up all over the years. So, in the meantime, I think it's um, uh, you've chosen a very topical issue uh, for the discussion this afternoon, because, uh, of course, everybody has noticed that uh, 
the election of President Biden has, of course, to reshuffle the global uh, energy and climate governance. Um, there is a three trillion uh, American job plan in preparation in the United States, which is uh, unprecedented uh, in many extent and uh, aims uh, for the US to uh, have uh, and take a global leadership notably in the modernization of its economy, but also in its decarbonization and in the development of low carbon technologies. We've also seen that President Biden has literally done a hold up uh, of the global climate governance because uh, that governance was clearly driven by the Europeans so far. And uh, without having uh, achieved any particular uh, success in decarbonization and having one of the world's the largest greenhouse gas emissions per capita, the United States has de facto managed to take by leadership of that climate governance. What is right is that um, that global climate governance and the Paris Agreement following COP21 uh, was made possible because of uh, a pre-agreement between Presidents Obama and Xi um, in 2014 um, nevertheless, of course, uh, the Trump uh, administration had really um, uh, had really fought hard to destroy the agreement, and I think it is uh, largely thanks to the European that the agreement survived. And so the the paradox and the quite uh, I think that is very satisfactory situation for the Europeans is that indeed uh, President Biden from that uh, from that point has uh, has now taken and imposed. Uh, his uh, uh, and US leadership back uh, in the field of uh, global uh, climate governance. Now, we do not doubt, of course, that uh, the United States uh, uh, is serious in its uh, desire to decarbonize. And uh, all the uh, commitment and pledges from uh, uh, candidate Biden are now being worked into concrete policies by the Biden administration. We have one uh, major question mark, which is uh, what will happen next year following the midterms election? Uh, but obviously, there is a huge room for bipartisan support to several of the current initiatives. So I think it's um, very timely, of course, that we have this uh, discussion about the United States. And I think uh, we are very privileged to have uh, two uh, a very uh, great and experienced and, of course, uh, 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 at least one American speaker and another one that knows and follows the United States very closely for a long time. So um, I am uh, basically... Uh, Referring to, uh, of course, uh, Manfred Afne, whom everybody knows well and uh, who will speak, and he was just on the picture, but he will speak a second. And uh, and before, uh, of course, we will uh, have the privilege to um, to listen to uh, another uh, great U.S. scholar, and uh, I am calling here Professor Amin Myers Jaif. Sorry for the mispronunciation. You are research professor and managing director of the Climate Policy Lab at the Fletcher School at Tufts University, which is one of the world's, uh, and at least uh, starting from the US, but at least uh, with a very global outreach. And uh, so we are very, very pleased to, to have your views on uh, uh, where the US is heading to, what are the, uh, the strengths, the weaknesses, what are the kind of uh, short to medium term perspectives, and especially what does this mean for the rest of the world, uh, be it uh, us in Europe or, or, and I include the Russians, of course, uh, as a European country in that. Um, uh, I'm very happy to, to give you the floor. Uh, we'll have uh, an opportunity then to, to raise questions and answers following a presentation. Then we'll move to Manfred Afner, who is uh, at the school, uh, he works at the School of Advanced International Studies, and then we'll have a joint discussion uh, on these uh, issues. Is that okay, Dimitri? Can we can we pass the floor to, to Professor Ami Myers Jafe? You are a chair, not me. Perfect. Uh, yes, but I, I always like to be under control from uh, some St. Petersburg, you know. Um, perfect. So the floor is yours. Um, please go ahead. Excellent. So uh, it's a, really a pleasure to be here and uh, join this group. Um, I tr I'm trying to uh, give you a broad overview, uh, but happy in the questions and answers to go into uh, more detail of specific aspects. Um, let's go to the first slide. So um, as was mentioned, 
the United States is, uh, is pivoting back to the global stage when it comes to climate change. And well, I guess we always thought we were having a policy on energy that was global. So, uh, so let's, let's stick with the climate change uh, uh, epithet on that for a moment. Um, I, I think what you're probably hearing that sounds a little different than either the Obama um, effort um, for the Paris Agreement, which I agree was focused uh, on coming up with a US-China alignment um, and then expanding that alignment to uh, marry together European views and you know, try to forge a global, um, global pledges. Um, the Biden policy I think is actually quite different. Um, you can kind of see in the statements coming lots and lots of policies and lots and lots of statements about climate change, about decarbonization strategy, and about um, climate resilience. So, you know, in the infrastructure bill, a lot of talk about climate resilience. Um, but I do want to point out uh, this very big difference. Um, whereas President Obama, I believe, had a sort of legacy vision that the United States need to move front and center in uh, climate change negotiations um, and in policy. Um, I would say that the Biden administration is very focused on national security as a top priority. And so therefore um, you're gonna hear and see more effort that marries together national security and climate change. Um, I think that's partly because as countries move forward, including the EU and Russia, um, countries are going to come to realize the contiguity of what used to be in the domain of national security um, being highly influenced by climate change. And, uh, and, and that those elements coming front and center to, um, to the welfare of citizens. Um, and, but in the United States, uh, you know, all politics is local. Um, this focus on national security when it comes to climate change uh, makes it easier to form bipartisan coalitions. Uh, that means that the policies would be less apt to be reversed um, in, by the midterm elections or by some future presidential election, right? So there's a greater emphasis today in the United States to come up with policies that will be long lasting and consistent so that in the context of global climate negotiation leadership, uh, the United States leadership can be better relied upon um, because it's based on a national consensus um, on principles that go across the political spectrum. So um, the slogan, this year's slogan, right? Uh, you know, we keep changing our slogan. So our new slogan is uh, Build Back Better. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about Build Back Better and then I'll end with oil and gas because, um, you know, oil and gas is what I'm famous for, so even though I work only on climate change now, uh, people always want to know something that I'm thinking about oil and gas. So I threw in a couple of slides at the end. Um, but the US policy now on climate change, that's both domestic policy and, and I think you know a global perspective as well. Uh, we're talking about a three-pronged stool um, where long round economic competitiveness is the barometer um, under which policies are now judged in the United States and which get the strongest uh, bipartisan support, uh, huge emphasis on short and long range job creation. Uh, the energy's transition should not be a job killing exercise as the yellow vest movement in France uh, so aptly uh, showed or raising fuel costs for average people. So uh, again, emphasis on that also in the United States. And then I do think that um, the social justice movement in the United States is here to stay. And I think it would outlast 
uh, the midterms and so forth because it's demographically driven. And um, there might be a, a loud minority, uh, but it's still demographically driven and so therefore um, not likely to go away. Next slide. So one of the big features uh, that has broad support across the political spectrum in the United States and is really in, in the end somewhat of a continuation from the Trump administration um, and uh, maybe you know a little bit on steroids now uh, with the Biden team is uh, looking to next generation technology. Um, and in that, you know, people ask, you know, how does the United States feel about, you know, competition uh, with other countries? Um, and in this regard, I would say that the United States would like to be premier. Um, it's looking to its alliance system um, to uh, boost the pace of decarbonization through some of these technologies. And, um, but you're gonna have a lot of focus on AI, uh, uh, advanced manufacturing. I think the United States is gonna stay on track um, uh, on favoring advanced nuclear. Uh, but with the, uh, I think where the Trump administration was focused a lot on advanced nuclear and, um, and then also on AI, I think you're gonna see more emphasis on the Biden administration on EV charging, electricity storage, hydrogen, and so forth. So some greener technologies are coming back into favor uh, in the United States, both from an R&D perspective and from the US government providing finance and public finance and, and tax support. Um, now, I have a new book out, plug the book for two minutes, Energy's Digital Future. Um, I do think that aligns with uh, some of the things we discuss in the book, aligns, I think, with the way the Biden administration is thinking about digitization um, as being a major, um, a major feature uh, that can bring a, a strong change uh, in U.S. competitiveness uh, and maybe judging U.S. competitiveness uh, in terms of the Chinese electrostate, which I'll talk about in a minute. Okay, next slide. So uh, two of the big new things I think you're gonna hear out of the United States and this alliance again with Europe. So I think you know, a lot of room for collaboration, um, both from the private sector and uh, from the government side uh, is the just huge potential um, in the East Coast of the United States and uh, Northwest Europe and deep offshore wind. Um, and then how to either connect that or other ways uh, to promote the development of uh, green hydrogen. Next slide. And I think one of the interesting tensions in the United States, because of course we have so much natural gas uh, like Russia, um, is you have a lot of uh, major initiatives uh, on, and the White House just this yesterday uh, released its new strategy on carbon sequestration. So uh, definitely a focus, um, but there is this sort of competition in people's minds um, between what the cost is going to be for blue hydrogen um, versus uh, green hydrogen. And uh, I think you're gonna see that play out um, in the Congress and uh, other places in terms of the constituency for how we're gonna get to this hydrogen and what gets subsidized and what doesn't get subsidized. Um, and I think the United States has the same kind of debate that we see in Europe, where you have some parties that feel that natural gas is uh, too dirty to consider. And, um, and you have other party and therefore they wanna fast track green hydrogen. Um, and then you have others that are spending a lot of time and attention on, you know, hydrogen blending with natural gas and other kinds of uh, synthetic methane and other kinds of ways of utilizing natural gas with CCS or otherwise um, to make hydrogen. Next slide. Oh, and let me go back to that slide for a minute. So one of the key interesting um, elements uh, in the question, um, which I think is highly relevant 
um, for Moscow, as well as Brussels uh, and Washington, is, is it possible that the cost for green hydrogen um, could be lower, especially from offshore wind, um, than uh, blue hydrogen? And uh, Bloomberg, which New Energy Finance, which has been pretty accurate on battery costs and solar panel costs, uh, although the science community has been actually behind. In other words, the, the science community is saying something's going to be more expensive for a prolonged period of time. And Bloomberg Energy, New Energy Finance said, no, there's going to be economies of scale. They're going to hit in the following year, blah, blah, blah. Uh, one of the interesting things is that electrolyzers is not a complicated technology. And Bloomberg is seeing that becoming more cost effective um, than blue hydrogen in the next 10 years. Next slide. So um, what's China's aim here? And, and I think that this goes to um, how we view green energy. You know, is this something the whole world's going to collaborate on and we're going to have open sourced technology? Um, or is this something where China's on the road to dominating um, the technology and other countries are catching up? And um, uh, our organizers today asked me to talk about the Chinese electro state. Um, we're not using that term yet in the United States. So I ran it by a few energy experts here and they, they love the term. I guess it was coined by The Economist magazine. Um, but uh, I have here in my presentation um, some slides from Tsinghua. Uh, and if you look at um, the plan uh that would have to be implemented like what what's the modeling show out of china for um coal uh china basically uh to stay at in line with the pledges made by the government for 2060 um have to completely phase out coal and um and and you see this sort of boost in uh renewable energy nuclear energy and CCS um, as sort of the dominant technologies that uh, Chinese scholars think the country needs to embrace. Next slide. So I put together a few um, bullets uh, on China, um, but I think the big takeaways for me are, are twofold. Um, one is that um, we should be expecting a major industrial innovation policy uh, out of China for the grid, for EVs, rail, uh, digital, uh, digital dual use, um, and the industrial in internet. Um, I wanted to call attention to the fact that uh, the Chinese have set up the Global Energy Interconnection Development and Cooperation Organization, which aspires to having a one global grid um, and uh, you know China is not thinking of that as a Southeast Asia grid. Um, this Guido organization has opened offices in Latin America um, and other places and so um, that goes to this idea that um, that China you know uh, although the Belt and Road is slowed down that China still has a very global visit vision of its role um, in a global electricity system, uh, not just as an exporter of solar panels. Um, so let me go to the next slide. Um, so if you look at um, the element of the BRI that is on um, energy, uh, you know, it's a vast majority of what the Chinese are doing, the BRI is energy related. Um, our studies show that a lot of the Chinese BRI finance uh, is targeting uh, the sales of their own equipment, um, which is then, of course, boasted as being cheaper than other suppliers. Sometimes that's not actually true. Um, sometimes there is European supply that's available that's competitive. Sometimes there's European finance that's available and countries go 
um, with the Chinese model, maybe because government to government um, collaboration is easier to uh, pull off. And, and I think the way Russia needs to think about the Chinese electrostate is as a export competitor um, to natural gas. Next slide. Um, US LNG. So uh, the United States, I think, is aiming to be in a more unique situation where it's both an exporter of uh, natural gas and an exporter of clean technology. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're still in expansion mode in the US, despite what, you know, the dire outcomes that people are talking. So we're expected to reach uh, 12 BCFD of uh, feed gas uh, by the year end, as we have two new facilities coming online, the sixth train from Chenier and uh, the global, Venture Global uh, facility. Um, and, you know, uh, next slide, um, people have done some work on, uh, you know, what it takes to get $2 US gas into the global market. Um, I would say that uh, there's a lot of natural gas in the United States, and we're going to have rules about um, ending flaring. So um, if companies want to produce the oil, they're going to have to find a home for the natural gas. And the obvious place for it's going to be exporting it, um, because the United States, if you look at California, which was a, a big market originally for U.S. natural gas from the Gulf Coast, and you look at New England, New England's working hard to fast track deep offshore wind. California's made a commitment to 100% renewables, um, and so I think that whatever natural gas, um, I, I think there'll be pressure for natural gas to be exported going forward. And maybe $2 is optimistic in terms of in the long-term price in the US. Um, maybe not, but I think there's gonna be a pressure to export. Uh, next slide. Um, and then I wanted to mention a new study we have uh, out from um, Columbia, where I also have a position besides the position at Tufts. Um, I'm, uh, have a position at the Center on Global Energy Policy. And we just finished a big study um, out to 2030 looking at scenarios for oil demand. Uh, we use the IEA model um, to, do, uh, to do scenarios. And we, um, we looked at uh, various kinds of um, changes that might come you know, and, but the two axes that we used uh, to define um, the scenarios were what would be the rate of pandemic globally and, um, and what would be the rate of technology launch, you know, digital and clean energy technology. And um, I want to call your attention to the forced revitalization scenario. Uh, that is the scenario that most closely aligns with the technologies that I write about in my book and, um, and, and the premise that, which seems a little bit accurate today, that the pandemic is going to web and way, right? So we're going to have periods or differential, um, differential uh, levels of pandemic in different parts of the world at different times. And so therefore, some of these more optimistic scenarios like roaring 20s um, or uh, delayed carbon action um, where there's no pandemic and uh, fossil fuels you know go back into roaring you know demand just increases exponentially uh, which is kind of the way the market's thinking about it uh, maybe in my view in a bubble uh, right now with oil prices um, you know might not come to and um, and I have one last uh, observation about the oil market and just about uh, the move to to, Paris, uh, to Glasgow. Um, the United States focus in its climate position internationally has been to raise the ambition for finance for the global south. 
And I think that's the right focus today, given the inequality of vaccine distribution and the tonality that's created in international relations in general. And I think the United States is trying to address that um, in the climate change context because it really colors um, how and what is going to be possible going forward. And, um, and I think that when we did these scenarios for oil, um, you know, I think maybe our biggest takeaway, um, which we can discuss in the Q&A, is that heretofore, there's been a huge disconnect between governments that um, are firmly in control of economic activity and governments where there's a more free market um, approach. But COVID really changed that in a way um, that I think people have not registered it when they talk about climate change uh, or the future of the oil and gas industry. And that, as, that is governments in Western democracies have more actively injected themselves into people's daily life in a way that 10 years ago, we would have said, oh, that, 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 that would never happen. And, and that, I think, lays a groundwork for the tolerance people might have in having governments um, ask them to use their car differently or move about differently or live differently. And, um, and I don't think we necessarily see that effect yet. I can talk a little bit about, you know, how much telecommuting and so forth, I think will stick, but um, it lays a different groundwork for what I can ask people to do generationally um, with their daily life when it comes to reducing emissions, because I've asked people to do very unusual things to protect public health. I'll stop there. Thank you so much uh, for this most uh, interesting uh, presentation. I uh, uh, have particularly enjoyed uh, uh, the attempt also to bridge uh, uh, with uh, some common issues that we have across the Atlantic and, and of course, also with Russia. Um, a, a first quick remark, indeed, it's, it's uh, uh, interesting that you've uh, highlighted the, the potential for, for clean hydrogen and, uh, and the fact that actually, uh, uh, if we put colors, green hydrogen might ultimately beat blue hydrogen. And I must say that in the current context of soaring gas prices in Europe, I'm a bit... Uh, by the way, that's a quick remark, a side remark, but I'm a bit surprised by the fact that uh, Gazprom is not factoring in the fact that this is uh, ultimately uh, going to fuel uh, arguments for those who want to basically kick out gas and who are looking for alternatives uh, to gas in the future energy transition in Europe, because with such high gas prices, it's obvious that uh, hydrogen-based gas economy will uh, will find uh, difficulties, especially if you consider also that the ETS price is rising. Um, a, a second uh, remark, uh, but that's more than a question, would be basically, um, how did you perceive the uh, reactions in the US to the IEA net zero report? Um, and basically, how do you see the, the future role of gas in the US? Because it's obvious that uh, Coal has to be phased out or abutted. Um, it's it's very interesting that the CCS strategy came out. Where do you see there the biggest difference to what was uh, there uh, during the Trump uh, administration, which has this, uh, which had these uh, tax credits uh, passed through Congress? And can it work for power generation? Because obviously, uh, in many areas in the world. Uh, it's very expensive to do CCF, CCS coupled with power. It's often more convenient to do CCS directly with industries. Um, but maybe, maybe the situation is different in the US. What we've seen so far is that the US CCS projects have been a total failure. 
Um, the next perhaps question that, that also arises is uh, related to, to basically the, the perception of what President Biden has been doing so far. Um, and also in relation to this IA Net Zero report, do you have the impression that the US has been changing that, uh, you know, um, this, uh, he, he, I mean, the Democrats somehow managed to, to, to really also get the more Republicans on board? Or do you see that the Trump era divisions are still out there? Um, and uh, and, and uh, I raised this question to, to better understand what could happen uh, uh, during the midterms. And the last point, for, perhaps on my part, is uh, is how do you see the future of U.S. basically oil and gas uh, production? We now have very high prices. Uh, we know that uh, people in OPEC Plus are worried about two things: the level of storages and inventories, notably in China. Uh, they have fallen in Europe, but they are still uh, rather high in China. And and of course, how the demand recovers. But but obviously, the elephant in the room is whether. U.S. Uh, supply can pick up, and if so, to what extent is that, can that be sustainable or not? And uh, I think uh, we would also appreciate a, a view on that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and um, uh, I, I'm just looking here in the chat box, um, and uh, uh, I see no, I see no particular question here. So maybe you could start with answering these, and meanwhile, people can just write down a question or say, I want to uh, ask a question, I will pass them the floor. So, so let me start by sharing what's going on in the US oil and gas industry, um, you know, kind of separate from the Biden administration, but somewhat related, um, because I think you don't hear about that as much as, you know, some of the sort of political things and, um, and there's a lot going on. Um, and I want to point you to something that's different than um, what people are expecting. You know, we have the met new methane leakage legislation that's been passed and signed and, and you know, we're kind of turning the clock back on that a little bit. Um, but, you know, there might be this perception that the US oil and gas industry is just gonna, you know, donate and back to the hilt, you know, a, a, you know, the push for uh, a change and back to Republicans for the midterms and, you know, what if they win and it's, you know, all going to be over and Biden will not be able to push forward any policies. Uh, I think that that's not the right way of thinking about it, regardless of whether you could watch American television and pick on, turn on a particular station here or there, and it would look like that's what's going to happen. Um, that's not exactly what's going to happen regardless of what happens with the midterm elections. And that is because the oil companies are losing the battle with their own shareholders, which I know has been reported in the press. And the impact of that um, is actually pretty dramatic in the United States sector. So, and, and what do I mean by that? So companies are seeing that they have to come up with a strategy that's going to either maintain their access to capital or um, you know, put them in a competitive position vis-a-vis -vis their own peers. And um, you know, I, I, I had one a friend of mine who's a consultant to the oil industry said he was in Houston last week and, um, and the sort of theme that people parlaying ESG products to the oil industry use is, well, if it could happen to ExxonMobil, think of what could happen to you. Um, and so, um, so I don't know if that's really the right context, but the bottom line is um, you have some really interesting things that people are looking at. And I think that the effort on CCS, which has been just a lip service effort, like we're going to drive for CCS by 2030. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that, that's something I'm saying but am I really doing anything? Um, I, I think you're gonna see some actual real effort and you might see some innovation. So there's one technology that's being talked about. I don't know how serious it is where, um, where people looking at a CCS technology where you're going to break out hydrogen and try to come out with solid black carbon. Um, and that way you can just you know bury the carbon, um, but um, I think you're, 
going to see new and different CCS and CCUS technologies in the White House announcement is trying to put some momentum behind that. Um, I think that the president is serious when he says that he's concerned what happens in oil and gas communities in red states. I mean, I believe him, but you know, maybe that's just me. Um, so, so, so I do see that. Um, I think one of the interesting, and, and so I do, you know, we'll see incentives. We might see some state initiatives. Texas seems to be um, organizing itself. There's a really interesting hydrogen project now out of Houston and uh, with a lot of participation from the industry and some support. Um, and, uh, and I just think you're going to see more activity from the private sector. Uh, and it'll be backed up by, you know, public finance, uh, not as a greenwashing, but because companies really realize they need to do something. Um, on your comment about Gazprom, um, understand the politics of um, Nord Stream 2. So, you know, saving our eggs or maybe, you know, you know, does it really matter where one stores the gas? Does it have to store the gas in Europe? Can you just, is it just as good to store the gas in Russia, right? You know, there's a storage time of year. Um, you know, maybe there's some security that comes from storing the gas uh, in Russia instead of elsewhere. But, um, you know, the history, and this goes beyond just, you know, the current gas price in Europe. The history of energy companies or OPEC or OPEC plus or any other grouping, um, thinking that they can grab rents for some period of time. Usually they think it's permanent. Um, I've seen some, one of the reasons I put up the 12 BCFD slide, even though I'm not really like a person who covers the LNG market, um, is that there's this storyline um, that somehow there's not gonna be any LNG for five years. And so therefore, um, you know, Russia can charge whatever it wants because whatever LNG there is, it's going to go to China. And, you know, there's a whole storyline there. You know, the problem with that storyline and any other storyline about oil demand um, is that the one thing we know from history is that the second you have a high price, it stimulates other solutions. And the difference between today and even 2009 2008, 2009, is that these digital technologies are just sitting there. They are ready to use. You know, we know how to use them. They're available. And, you know, you can say, well, this one's expensive or that one's expensive, but it's only expensive if oil and gas is cheap. If oil and gas is expensive, it's easy to deploy. Now, Europe already has a policy of blending hydrogen. I guess that's a problem because of an energy content basis, but um, you know, if you have excess infrastructure, uh, you can you know, put in a certain amount of hydrogen into the natural gas stream, and then you need less natural gas. You know, that was the lesson of ethanol in the United States. 10% ethanol means you need 10% less physical natural gas, of uh, physical gasoline. So you know, hydrogen could be the same thing. Um, so the question is going to be, you know, uh, if I raise the price somewhere for some period of time, you know, even if it's six months, um, people will react, you know, if it was too expensive to have a battery in your home and do virtual power plant in a community, would you do it now? If you think the gas or gas price is going to stay high, um, you might, right? So. That's really been the experience in the United States is it's been pretty easy to sell uh, some of these new technologies in different places. You have all these states claiming they're gonna go to 100% renewables and the Texas electricity crisis notwithstanding, you know, part of the problem with the Texas electricity crisis is it came from natural gas, right? So, um, you know, so, so I, I really do think that, um, there is a substantial debate in the United States about closing down natural gas in different parts of the country. California is committed to getting natural gas out of its system. And that means heat pumps. Um, it means more hydro. 
you know, I, I, so, some of the ways they think they're going to do it might be slightly impractical today, but um, using software to do time of day pricing and using batteries more efficiently um, if they're widely deployed uh, is actually a better solution and hydrogen could wind up being a better solution. So, um, so I do think it's going to eat away natural gas demand over time. And because China is, you know, moving to be an electro state, they have an interest in exporting all of that technology and getting people to do it in Africa. Um, and so, you know, some of these ambitious population driven forecasts that say, you know, we're going to need so much oil and gas and so forth uh, could wind up being harder to stand up over time, especially if the price is high because there's technologies that can be deployed, if nothing else, to improve productivity and efficiency. I mean, the global world is falling. I was considered having a slide on this because we're a group of economists, but then I thought, well, no, it's not on the topic, but I was going to provide a slide, which I have, about how the global oil intensity has been falling. And it's going to continue to fall with these digital technologies. Um, thank you so much, uh, so much, Amy. Uh, that was uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, interesting. And, uh, uh, and indeed, by the way, the latest uh, uh, sanction list on, on Chinese uh, solar panel manufacturers, uh, at least those that are based in Xinjiang, will probably also have as a side effect the fact that the Chinese will seek to, to open up new markets in replacement of uh, some of the exports that were going to the US and probably of some of those that will no more uh, go to Europe in the coming uh, months and years. Um, look, well, I see that there is a couple of questions that are coming here in the chat box, so that's very good, and I'd like to thank uh, those who have raised them. Now, I suggest we move to Manfred, and after Manfred's presentation, people have some more time to put in more questions, and I will then gather those questions and, 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 and raise them for our two uh, speakers, uh, if that's fine. So, if you don't mind, uh, let's uh, give the floor to, to Manfred. Many thanks, uh, Amy, and so we'll have an opportunity to, to go back then uh, in the second round uh, to follow up on, on your points. Uh, Manfred, are you with us somewhere? There you are, excellent. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, great to see you again. Thank you and hello to all my friends who are here. Let me try to. Okay, now um, when I was asked by the organizers to speak in this event, I was indeed a bit uh, embarrassed to talk as a European and a non-American to talk about what uh, the organizers had called the US contemporary energy and environmental agenda. But then the organizers, Dimitri, Vasilienko, Ralph Tickle, also Marc Antoine, f convinced me to somehow participate anyway. And as they are all friends, I eventually accepted, even though I'm still not sure it was the right thing to do. But here I am, and you have to bear with me. Yeah. I, uh, I'm particularly grateful to Professor Amy Mayers Jeff and I also, I just like uh, uh, Marc Antoine, I'm not sure to have pronounced your name properly, Amy, uh, for having given us such a brilliant uh, overview of US and climate policy. Now, what I, as a European, want to share with you is uh, a European view on the present uh, US uh, energy and climate policies, and more particular, a personal view as a European. People who know me know that I'm very often a bit outspoken and I do apologize in advance if I say things which uh, you may not, not agree with, but this, uh, as I see it, uh, is a very aim of uh, discussions because it's also all, only when we have different uh, views that uh, we can advance. Now let me start by saying that most people in Europe and uh, most uh, political decision makers in Europe have been very happy at the news that Joe Biden had been elected the 46th US president. 
This will certainly smoothen, and it has already smoothened, transatlantic US-European relations, relations. After four years, which, at least from a European perspective, they had often been per perceived as difficult from a trade policy to NATO, to, you, to the US involvement or better non-involvement in international organizations and multilateralism in the relations uh, in the Middle East, but also on climate and energy policies where we very often had very different governmental views from the two sides of the great pond. And indeed, over the last few months, we have witnessed a renewed rapprochement between the two, the two historical strategic allies on most of the issues on which we had divergent views with the previous administration. On the very day of his inauguration, President Biden has kept his promise to re-enter the Paris Accord. In April, the US have announced its commitment to reduce the CO2 emissions by 2030 by 50 to 52 percent compared to 2005, with the objective to reach net zero by 2050. Having said that, we think the Biden administration needs to deal with a very complex internal political context. And as far as the climate agenda is concerned, the Republican Party is still strongly opposed to strong decarbonization policies. And also, this at least is my impression, the Democratic Party is not always advancing unisono on this topic. Now, Biden seeks to obtain, as Amy mentioned it, a bipartisan support for its massive American job plans, promoting the reconstruction of US infrastructure, which should also significantly contribute to decarbonizing the electricity sector by 2035, with investments of about 100 billion in the electricity set, in the electricity networks and clean energy technologies. Having said so, the impression we have is that the support in Congress is still somehow uncertain. On the one hand side, because a majority in the Senate is hair thin, and not all Democrats may always vote along party lines. And secondly, because the Democrats must not lose the midterm elections next year, 2022, it has been mentioned a few times, as Obama, by the way, did in 2010, and as Clinton as well, as well did in 1994. Now, on, uh, on the 22nd and 23rd of April, the Biden administration has hosted a global climate summit to mark the Earth Day, named, as we know, after the largest ever environmental demonstration staged in the US some 51 years ago. The summit celebrated the re-entry of the US into global climate politics, and it allowed the President Biden to put some, to, to meet his pre-election statements that the environmental crisis is central to his program. And the climate summit also presented an important shift in focus concerning governmental action from the US administration. Up to that moment, the Biden's administration's agenda had been mainly dominated by, let's call it, uh, disaster management. Efforts have been devoted to rolling out the vaccine, 
program and delivering a third huge round of fiscal relief to American firms and households. The president had to deliver something, but then the president uh, had to deliver something more long term a credible commitment to cutting at least 50% of emissions by 2030 and achieving net zero by 2050. The crisis fighting up to then has worked. After a slow start, the vaccine rollout has been impressive, transforming American outlook on the virus. The US had been the, the, the last of the class and they have become the first of the class in uh, in a few months, chapeau. The uh, 1.9 trillion COVID relief bill was forced through Congress on March 11 against unified Republican opposition. Now, on top of the previous round of economic relief, it's add up to the largest fiscal package in history, sized at more than 25% of GDP. This provoked fierce criticism from Clinton era veterans such as Larry Summers, and it represents a sharp break with a fiscal orthodoxy defined by the Clinton and Obama administrations. Now, this double shock of the Trump, Trump's presidency and the COVID 19. Uh, 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 ep epidemia has driven centrist politicians like Biden and technocrats, including the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, to, to take a leap on traditional economic policy. For the Biden team to propel the global transition to clean energy, it must make the same leap on climate policy. The administration, we think, needs to break not only with Trump's climate denialism and fossil fuel enthusiasm, but it also, but it also needs to break with the climate legacy of the Obama and Clinton administration. And I will explain what I mean. The, the Democrats in the US have for a long time been America's Sorry, the Clinton administration helped to negotiate, as we know, the original Kyoto Accords in 1997, the first international treaty committing participant states to binding targets on climate, uh, on tackling climate change, even though the US then never ratified the, 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 the accord. Al Gore had uh, almost become the climate president, but uh, as we know, the Supreme Court in 2000 uh, uh, um, scratched uh, his uh, 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 becoming president. And uh, the Obama administration pumped a lot of money into the US solar energy industry and it brokered uh, and it participated in brokering the 2015 Paris Agreement. But at the same time, it was also Obama's administration, hemmed, of course, in by the Republican Congress, that defined the limits of the Paris Accord as little more than the aggregate of more or less adequate national plans. And we know that we are not where we need to be. Obama's own energy policy was not dominated by renewables but much more by the market power of fracked gas, which of course is the cleanest of, us, of, all, of all fossil fuels, but it will not bring us to, to a fully decarbonized planet. Now, given even that gas is so much cheaper in the US than coal, even Trump was not able to turn the country back on coal, as we know. That is what he wanted, that he promised. But uh, And the US has now a large pool of gas at the assets, fracking wells, pipelines, power plants, associated petrochemical industries, for which 
that can be no long long term use if it is to meet ambitious target emissions emission targets now amy told us uh, they will go i don't know i think there is a lot of resistance now when we look at and we put sight now on net zero because this is a new mantra by 2050 there is no longer any room for fudges the biden administration if they are serious they need to change the direction of energy policy radically from obama's all of the above everything to a systematic exit from fossil fuels. It needs to find both economic and technical solutions to make a green energy system viable. Otherwise, it's not serious. But it also, of course, needs to win the political argument. And this is the most complex and difficult part, of course. While the technological uncertainties and economic obstacles of planning for net zero future are universal. We all have to deal with them. America's distinctive issue and problem, in my eyes, is the political question of commitment. While in Europe and in most of the industrial, uh, in, 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 the, in the advanced economies of the whole world, there is today a general consensus Maybe not everybody agrees, but there is a general consensus among all major parties and major stakeholders that we need to decarbonize. There is still a big question of political commitment in the US, in my eyes. I may be wrong, but this is what I feel. Decarbonization is not, a, is not something you can do in five minutes. It's not something we can do in, with one mandate in four years. It's a long-term business, and it needs to be pursued with strong dedication on the long term. In other words, it calls for a wide consensus for its implementation. Otherwise, it will not work. And the problem, as I see it, is that there is nothing close to a consensus in US politics on the need for action. And as serious, and I do not think that he is not serious, as serious as the Biden administration may be about tackling the climate crisis, its power to deliver on this depends on having the votes in Congress, a balance, by the way, as we have already discussed, which may shift next year in the 2022 midterms, or in 2024, new presidential elections, or in 2026, new midterms, and so on. In other words, without a broad societal agreement, each US election will be a heart-stopping moment of political derailment. Of course, as I said before, in every advanced economy, there are economic interests opposed to deep, rapid decarbonization, including those of businesses, consumers, and sometimes even some labor unions. Where the US, in my opinion, however, is unique among advanced economies that it has one of its two major governing parties committed to outright climate denial and a large part of the public with it and unless this can be changed i think america will remain a fundamentally unreliable partner in the effort to, ha to halt, to stop global heating. Now, the Biden administration has uh, drawn lessons from the failures of the Clinton and Obama presidencies. <laughs> and uh, the 
you know, the policy instrument that most economists agree that is essential for a comprehensive decarbonization of the world, including of the US economy, which is carbon pricing, has been completely left off the agenda in 2021. Carbon pricing, as we know, is imposing a cost on emissions sufficient to incentivize polluters to reduce or eradicate their carbon footprint. Now, this omission is, of course, one of the history's ironies, because it was the US who first introduced market approaches to tackle uh, environmental issues. It was the US Environmental Defense Fund in the late 1980s that persuaded, at that time, President George Bush uh, uh, to, adopt, uh, to adopt cut and trade, uh, a system for allocating the rights to emit uh, through permits. Uh, which can be bought and sold as the most effective way to drive down emissions. And uh, we in Europe, with some hesitation at that time, we took on this American model in 2005, when the European Union set up the emission trades trading systems. For a long time, in particular after 2010, after the, the uh, economic crisis, the, the system did not let deliver in Europe. The price was too low. But today, the rising prices of the ETS, of the emission trading schemes, is beginning to apply real pressure to the large polluters in Europe. Also, China, following the European lead, is introducing its own carbon pricing system. In the US, on the other side, Carbon pricing, it, yes, it was put on the agenda in the agendas of both the Clinton, Clinton and Obama administrations. In Clinton's case, through carbon taxation. In Obama's case, through cap and trade. But uh, both, and, and both had actually majorities in Congress at that time. But in both cases, when it came to the final, you know how it works, agonizing battles that accompany every major piece of legislation in the US, the majority some, somehow evaporated. And these defeats, I think, have scared the US climate movement today. And one of the, it is interesting, because one of the striking, striking absences in the Green New Deal resolution introduced in 2019 by congressional Democrats Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and Ed Markey, is carbon pricing. It's not, it's absent. It has been regarded as a new, as a new liberal placebo rather than an effective policy. I, this reminds me the, the, the discussions in Europe some 20 years ago. But this is uh, the new reality of the US. Yes, we have state level schemes uh, which operate in California, but it is deeply unpopular even among the Democratic Party left, which view it as discriminatory and regressive, and regressive mechanism to give pollution permits to corporations and the rich. Now, we know economists most experts, we continue to insist that if the revenue raised by carbon pricing are reallocated to lower income households, it can be a tool for positive redistribution. But the impression is that in the US, the Biden team despairs of brokering of such a complicated deal. The carbon prices we think are necessary to make a real difference that to implement the policies which the, the uh, uh, Biden administration wants to implement. And it, makes a, it would make a, a real difference 
especially starting from a very low level in the US. Unlike Europe, for instance, in the US, not even petrol is taxed heavily. And the last thing I understand, the last thing the Biden administration needs and wants is a gilet jaune style of movement we have experienced in France last year. Now, instead of using prices to incentivize to incentivize polluters to reduce fossil fuel consumption and to shift supply to cleaner energy sources, the Biden administration's first action actions have centered on regulations and on carbon pricing standards. This is not new. It was a method already used during the Obama second term after the Supreme Court gave the Environmental Protection Agency the right to oversee carbon emissions. The problem is that it is fragile because it is subject to court challenges. But yes, it is the first step towards the Biden administration's aim of achieving a carbon-free electricity system by 2035. Now, where, so of course, clean energy technologies, and Amy has spoken about this, they are important and they are already maturing very fast. But given America's huge energy consumption, shifting from gas and coal to variable solar and wind requires a vast amount of extra capacity, as well as uh, new cross-country transmission systems to ensure clean, that clean power gets from the states with plenty of wind and sun in the center of the US to the coastal conurbation that needed most. And it was a surprise to many of us to realize many of us were not aware of that, that Texas was cut off of the rest of, uh, of, the, of the US electricity system and, uh, and it's not the only one. So there is a lot of work to be done. And the growth in demand will be compounded by the need to shift transport and domestic and industrial heating to electricity as well. So where will all this investment come from? Biden administration uh, gave us the answer uh, uh, with the, the two trillion American jobs plan uh, uh, when it, it was announced with big fanfare addressing the ills of American society from inequality and unemployment to crumbling autocracy and as well the climate crisis. Now, a lot of things to be tackled. And the question, of course, is, is the investment program big enough and will it actually reduce emissions? Now, this two trillion uh, uh, headline sounds very impressive when we put it together and as time comes by, it may be indeed closer to three billion, as Mark Antoine mentioned. But uh, the, the total sum actually matters less than the timing. While the coronavirus aid, relief and economic security acts, they were immediate, they were dispersed in a matter of month. The infrastructure program is spread over eight years. Now, when you take two to three trillion and you spread them over eight years, much less is left over per year. If you spend, uh, if we imagine, and this is this may be a generous estimate, that half of this sum, two to three trillions, is devoting to tackling the climate change, the climate crisis, we end up between one and 1.5 trillions over eight years, and this comes around to 0 0.5 percent of current GDP annually, and that is far short of any reasonable estimate for the investment needed for decarbonization. Just as an example, Bernie Sanders' camp, they wanted 16 trillion. The, uh, 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 the, the Thrive Act, proposed, supported by uh, uh, groups associated with the, the Green New Deal, were asking of 10 trillion, and 80% of which focused on climate. 
Now, the size of the proposed schemes reflect the unprecedented scale, of course, of the challenge. Um, the, the, when we break down the items, including the package, we really understand the modesty of the, the, the package. Let's take passenger railway transport, an area which we all know in the US lags far behind China and other advanced economies like Europe and many others. And the job plans proposes 10 billion per annum over eight years. Now, as the, the, the job plans writes itself, it should allow America to address Amtrak's repair backlog, modernize the high traffic Northeast corridor, improve existing corridors and connect new city pairs. Yes, it will create good jobs, but it will not catapult the US in an age of high speed rail travel to match that pioneered by Japan and China. China today has 30,000 kilometers of high speed track. America has 800 kilometers. And, uh, and so on. Um, uh, most plans for a rap rapid energy transition suggest that getting to net zero by 2050 will involve a total investment of 5 to 7% of GDP per year, but only about 1 to 2%, only a quarter, a quarter to a third of this 5 to 7%, so 1 to 2% per year needs to be additional investment. The rest has to be diverted urgently from further investment in fossil fuels towards clean energy systems. Now, without, and I come back to my idea, without a steep increase in carbon prices, there is no market incentive to cut fossil fuel investment. Well, maybe higher oil prices will do. But uh, other than through regulations, it is not clear how the Biden administration proposes to make the announcements, to the announced dramatic energy transition to net zero happen. So, um, uh, I think you got my idea. The, uh, I do not doubt uh, in any way the, the sincerity of the Biden team, but I think there is a, a limitation uh, uh, in the plan, but much more fundamentally, there is a, a limitation in the, the societal support in the US for this plan. And it does of course not help if uh, one of the two major parties continue to deny the very problem. Uh, now, what does this mean for the world and in particular, how, can, how should Europe respond to this American drama? Manfred, if you mind, quickly, perhaps, uh, so that we can then uh, move to the discussion because uh, you're a bit already uh, went beyond your time. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, maybe uh, two words to conclude. I, I think that the global energy transition will only be won if uh, the whole world acts together. The three major geoeconomic blocks, the US, Europe and China, and they, today, they are all aiming to have a leading role in the global energy transition. And the impression we have today, rather than cooperate, they are in a competing modus, or worse, sometimes even in a rivalry modus, modus to each of them to pursue global leadership in the field of the energy transition. I think if we are to win the huge challenge of the energy transition and we are we want we need to we want to adapt a global go for a global pathway for net zero by mid century we need to have ambitious and concerted plans and work all together towards this challenge 
we will definitely not succeed fighting climate change by going each of us alone and even less we will succeed if we fight each other this means that the us europe and china in my opinion need to work together including also with their main present hydrocarbon suppliers like russia and the middle east offering them win-win solutions by participating in the effort of a low carbon world with eventually which eventually will be beneficial for the whole planet we need to have a cooperation between the us and europe and we also need to have cooperation with china as well as with russia the middle east and all the other economies of the world including india southeast asia latin america africa etc otherwise we're not going to win this challenge yes it will be expensive and this is the main argument why i mean i live in switzerland uh, the, the two weeks ago we had the government has lost a referendum uh, for the the, the 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 co2 law it will be proposed in a different way yes it will be expensive for us today but let's not forget that it will be even more expensive but not doing anything for our children and grandchildren sorry for having spoken too long thank you so much uh, manfred that was of course uh, a very stimulating and, and, and often critical view uh, from from Europe and, and from you as a person, as you mentioned. So uh, I'd like immediately to give back the floor to to Amy, because I'm sure, and, uh, and I've seen what you've uh, kindly contributed in responses already, uh, but I'm sure you'd like perhaps to react um, to what's been said and, and share about your views on, uh, on you know, um, what is uh, kind of there as a bipartisan uh, uh, elements. Uh, can the, uh, the U.S. is obviously not California yet, but uh, could it become more like California or could actually Texas change in a way? Um, how do you see the role of finance in that? Obviously, it's been playing a role or starting to play a role uh, with Exxon and, and Chevron, uh, looking at the shareholder meetings. Uh, how do you see this going further? A um, couple of remarks then from you, and then I think I'll pass the floor to uh, to James, because James had a couple of comments, uh, and he knows the country well as uh, too. So, so you may, uh, James, if that's okay with you, then take the floor uh, to address your questions or comments. So, Emmy, first, please go ahead. Well, let me thank uh, Professor Hafner for his comments. Um, you know, it's it's hard as an American today to talk about you know national priorities uh, when on TV we look so divided. Um, I guess what I would tell you is that, uh, and I say this as someone who has worked as a energy scholar in Texas uh, for 17 years, in California for five, uh, and now in New England for five, right? So I think I, I have an interesting vantage point um, having lived in different parts of the country, so I'm, I'm not in the bubble. Um, so uh, this is what I would tell you. I think that I began my talk with a statement that um, seemed like a you know innocuous general statement, um, but it's really a very meaningful statement. And that statement is, that we have a president of the United States who spent his entire career on national security. He doesn't need technical experts to help him on the subject of nuclear proliferation. He does not need technical experts to help him decide about balance of power issues. He is a technical expert and that makes him very different from many other presidents, all of whom I've interacted with, very different. And you have some advocates for climate in the US who have policies they'd like to see in place that would deeply accelerate the transition and they are not wrong about how pressing that need is. But 
there is an emphasis today on national security. And what I would tell you, um, you know, there were storylines in the United States, you can hear them on television, but the bottom line is my opinion of the president's approach is that he was gonna bet on reopening the economy of the United States. And, you know, for those of you who aren't traveling to the United States, the United States is open. You know, Jason Bordoff, who I work with at Columbia, just posted a photograph of himself listening to Bruce Springsteen inside a theater in New York City without a mask on. Now, that may turn out to be a good thing or bad thing in terms of disease spread. I, we're not going to know for six months, right? But the president reopened the economy and he did it by reviving US manufacturing. And I think that the idea that US manufacturing was dead, there's nothing we could do, we were a declining economy. You know, there are a lot of storylines um, that now look a little more doubtful when you look at what the first priority is. I mean, let's remember, president's only been president, I forget how many days, but you know, not that many days. And you know, to give, in fairness to the Trump administration that did a lot of things wrong, um, there are some things they got right. And, um, and the US economy is now benefiting from the sets of things. So there are some danger humps in how it's going to be sold in the United States. You know, understanding that the United States economy must be competitive with China and our supply chains must be secure is something that sells, I think, to anybody who thinks internationally and even to someone concerned about jobs. And, you know, I think that um, sometimes countries take an action that they think will give them tremendous strategic leverage. And so when we look at cyber, it does seem like countries got tremendous strategic leverage against the United States and cyber. But I think what we're going to see moving forward is that um, I called it on TV a Sputnik moment, not to be um, untactful since I'm, I uh, greatly respect my host for uh, welcoming me today, right? The United States is going to understand the cyber challenge. Some of the solutions to the cyber challenge are the same technology solutions that we need to do for climate change and I don't think a carbon price, I mean, you know, I'm an economist, I believe in a carbon price, but I don't think it's necessary. I think that the United States industry is going to be pressed to respond by the Securities and Exchange Commission, by their own shareholders, by the market. And the higher the price of oil and gas is, um, the easier it's gonna be for it to happen. Um, but the president also has tools. And, um, you know, part of the interesting thing about the transition and part of the interesting thing about coming after President Trump is that some of the tools that you have were tools that, you know, a President Clinton or a President Obama couldn't even consider. I think Professor Hafner points that out. He pointed out in a different context than I'm thinking of it. But, you know, clean slate. There's a clean slate today. You can propose all kinds of things. President Trump opened the dam by saying that he could get another couple dollars out of the budget by having the SPR not be as large. And the size of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve should be related to demand and oil demand is gonna go down. So the United States can afford in a rising oil price market where people in Europe are talking about $100 oil because you know the traders are going long, right? 
the president can afford to put sales of the SPR in the infrastructure bill to make it go. And he could wake up tomorrow morning as president since the Congress already authorized SPR sales and do that and pay for a lot of things without any pressure. So, I mean, I just give that as one example, but the War Powers Act, you know, was utilized, the military was utilized in ways that we haven't used it in the past. And it was successful, as Professor Hafner points out. And so there are a lot of tools that can be used. And we're seeing an unprecedented heat wave in the United States. People are all of a sudden in states that have never had to think about it. Um, we're thinking about whether we have to have wet bulb warning levels and we have to explain to the public um, what days you can and can't go outside. So I think that you know, we had a building collapse in Florida, right, from corrosion, you know, and, and, and sea level rise. I mean, in the end, you know, there were probably some buildings that was uh, some problems that were specific to that building, but it's raised the issue uh, in everybody's mind. So personally, I know the people um, that Professor Hafner is talking about. And I'm gonna tell you a quick anecdotal story. I was appearing on a broadcast much like this with top people like yourselves, but in this case, it was only chief executive officers of corporations. And it was myself and a person who's a billionaire from the oil and gas industry. And I'm not gonna say who it was because I'm gonna tell a story about them and that's not polite. So we did the pre-call and in the pre-call, this person explained to the uh, media company that was organizing the event that there's no climate change, that um, you know all this stuff that you know people like me talk about is just ridiculous, and you know he's very blunt. And um, I'm thinking to myself, God, this is going to be like a pretty interesting appearance for me. So I brought him ahead of our talk a chart, which I'd be happy to share with this group if uh, uh, Dimitri would like me to. I can email it, and he can distribute it to the group a chart that showed uh, two charts, one that showed the relative performance of uh, companies that have already pivoted like Orsted or Equinor uh, compared to companies that haven't pivoted and how many times multiples, how many multiples time revenue their stock was trading in comparison. And the numbers are something like a company like Orsted at the time was trading 40 times revenue and a company like Exxon was trading at three times revenue. And then I had the numbers um, because I know those numbers because I was an advisor to the pension fund at the UC as part of my job uh, as a professor at the UC, long story, got seconded to the pension fund, complicated story. Um, but I pulled together the private equity numbers for deals, if you'd invested in a wind farm or renewable, you know, solar and battery storage utility scale program, how much was your IRR in the five-year window, which was about seven to ten percent? And then I had the numbers for what your IRR would have been if you'd invested in U.S. oil and gas, and those numbers were negative. And I sent this chart, the two charts, to this gentleman, and I said. Uh, I don't think we should be polemical. Neither of us are scientists. Let's not talk about the size of climate change. Let's talk about the economics of your business. Here's what I'm going to say. And I sent him my charts. And he came to the forum a week later and talked about the importance of the US oil and gas industry pivoting towards the transition. Huh. That is my story. It's very illustrative of the kinds of conversations I have with companies every day in the United States. Amazing uh, story, Amy. Thanks for sharing, indeed. And uh, and, and and I'm convinced, indeed, that uh, money is more powerful than uh, scientific discussions in the U.S. And when you see that major insurance companies already claim that a, a growing part of the housing stock uh, could soon no more be uh, 
uh, eligible for insurance uh, because of climate change, uh, including then companies, etc. I think this is uh, more powerful than whatever discussion um, you might have on, on whether it's man driven or, or not, etc. So very interesting point. Um, thank you. And uh, and indeed, um, I'd like to, to bring in uh, two uh, of our participants. So first, uh, James Ball uh, with a comment, and then uh, Vladislav, uh, if that's fine. Uh, James, come in, uh, then uh, Vladislav, and, and then I will uh, just immediately also ask uh, Manfred, who, who can then also react, to also come up with some more precisions on, uh, you know, what is it exactly that China the US, Russia, the EU, and India uh, need to cooperate about. Uh, here is as a hint at hydrogen. You mentioned carbon pricing. So what is it exactly? Maybe no sanctions on low carbon technologies. Um, uh, you know, there are sanctions on Chinese nuclear and solar now. It's, I don't know. I mean, it's up to you. Um, and James, uh, the, the, the floor is yours. Okay, well, I, I'm not going to give a presentation from the floor, because as you know, as a chair, I'm, I, I highly discourage such behavior amongst the audience. But I have put a few written questions in the chat um, at your request, and uh, Amy has been busy answering them. So I went back through and I'll just deal with the ones that, that uh, she hasn't addressed. And, and by the way, I want to say, I first met Amy at a LNG workshop in in Texas at the Baker Institute. Um, you mentioned the uh, election that Al Gore lost. Baker was part of that. Um, anyway, uh, the um, what I wanted to ask, this issue of banning gas, it's not restricted to California. It's um, happening all over Europe uh, as with the policy measures that say we have to wait until green, so-called green hydrogen uh, uh, electrolysis technology is cheap enough before we allow any of it into the grid. Um, this happens uh, in parallel, these kind of bans on gas happen in parallel with massive experiments, which we have discussed for about five years at Energetica of repurposing the natural gas grid uh, to, to uh, from natural gas to hydrogen. And it just strikes me, uh, I mean, we, we, I've raised this in Europe, but I want to see what the response in the US is. Is there anybody, uh, I mean, I, I was born in California. I know how strange people there are. <laughs> is there anybody in California who is raising awareness of the massive, gas infrastructure, and I'm talking physical, uh, transmission, distribution, commercial, regulatory in California. Um, if you ban gas, presumably you ban gas central heating, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not that that's that important in California. Um, gas power, et cetera, gas use in houses. Um, before you can get switch it to hydrogen, uh, is there anybody pointing out that you can repurpose? Because experiments are going on in Europe, they're going on in the north of England um, that show how you can do that. So that was the, the question in respect to uh, California. And then the other thing that intrigued me in her comments was her point that you can get some irreversible policy measures in place with bipartisan efforts. Um, so that we don't get this um, seesaw, volatile, back and forth uh, extremes of policy that we saw in the last four years um, that Manfred uh, discussed. Um, and Amy replied in the chat that it's happening at a company level and her story illustrated just now and I could give examples myself. Um, I've been astounded in the last year how the attitude to climate has changed. Um, and I think not just by uh, relu people reluctantly uh, feeling their wallet getting thinner. Um, so I just wanted, if she could augment that company point that the companies are gonna do it anyway, like they did in coal, um, 
with, is there any political, um, what kind of policies might attract bipartisan support and survive uh, even a volatile change in policy such as um, Trump being reelected, for example, let alone uh, a shift uh, in, in Congress. So those are my two questions, California and political, uh, you know, sustainable political developments. So okay for me to take those on right now for a minute. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, perhaps, wait, wait one second. Let's collect just one other okay. uh, additional question. And then I give you back the floor to you and uh, to first and then to uh, Manfred uh, before I before we close. So um, Vladislav, um, I'm not, I, I don't know who you are exactly, but would you like to take the floor uh, if you are comfortable enough in English? Здрасте, Владислав, хотели бы задавать вопрос, может быть, на английском? Или прокомментировать? Uh, yes, yes, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, what... Uh, uh, kind uh, of uh, renewal such as uh, Keystone, Keystone uh, maybe Excel, uh, and uh, many uh, many projects now uh, stops. Many projects now start. Uh, for example, uh, South Stream breaking, uh, North Stream two start, and. Uh, Keystone stop. And uh, for example, P Pakistan uh, stream uh, starts now and uh, maybe it's uh, one of uh, future uh, projects, yes. And uh, uh, how, uh, how I think uh, uh, have uh, um, maybe some uh, future uh, in uh, Keystone Pepper Line uh, because uh, uh, now decarbonization, uh, now uh, new administration in uh, US, US, yes, and uh, this is breaking, uh, but uh, it's a very pro uh, it's uh, uh, very interesting project and. Uh, um, around uh, USA, uh, many other projects, but uh, uh, only uh, all uh, know uh, only about this paper line. Uh, maybe you uh, can, uh, uh, maybe you can, uh, um, what uh, uh, paper line? you in USA uh, be in future uh, perspective maybe uh, you think now how you think or only uh, ships only uh, paper line who US, US uh, can uh, have now and uh, it's only this Many thanks, uh, Vladislav, uh, uh, for your question on the uh, uh, future, say, trans-regional uh, uh, gas or oil infrastructure, also notably linking up with Canada. Uh, if that is going, we know that there are a couple of bottlenecks in the system. And what does this look like uh, under uh, President Biden? So thank you. So I, I pass the floor to Amy, then back to Manfred, and then uh, back to Dimitri for closing word. Uh, so, so, so don't make it too long in your answer, if you don't mind, so that we stick to the time. Thank you so much. So let me ask, answer quickly. Uh, James, uh, like many things, um, the state of California came to me, actually, uh, and worked with a close friend and colleague of mine, Joan Ogden, to look at how to repurpose natural gas pipeline system of California uh, to uh, facilitate clean energy and not natural gas. Um, and there's, there's two pathways, you know, one pathway 
is uh, renewable natural gas, right? So I'm gonna make a, a non-fossil natural gas, uh, kind of like BEX. Um, you know, some people say to add CCS to it, I think that could be like pretty damn expensive, but um, one way is to just green the pipeline system through biofuels that are gaseous. Um, Sempra's already doing that. Um, and then the question is, can I take that methane that I'm getting from agriculture and make uh, a hydrogen out of it? Um, so they're looking at that and they're looking at blending uh, in the natural gas pipeline system in California. So how much hydrogen uh, of any derivation, whether that's blue hydrogen, you know, gray hydrogen uh, or green hydrogen, could I put in the existing natural gas pipeline system and how would I do it? UC Irvine is working on the technical aspects of that. I think the state is pretty serious about it. Um, so uh, our first paper talked about timeline issues, but you know, Joan and I feel uh, uh, corrected. So we're doing a new paper on exactly that topic, looking at the whole US, um, because I do think there's some uh, impetus to uh, look at it across the United States and think about what parts of the US, whether that's Midwest wind or offshore wind in New England, like where would it make sense to repurpose infrastructure? Uh, so that's definitely getting a close look in the United States. Um, uh, for policies that um, are bulletproof, uh, the Congress vetoed President Trump's cuts to R&D in energy, clean energy technologies four years in a row. Strong support for that in Congress. Um, I, and I think that um, increased focus on CCS and CCUS we're going to see. I think that advanced nuclear um, is still on the agenda. Um, and has bipartisan support. Um, and so, um, you know, I, 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 like I said, I think it's a non-carbon pricing uh, solutions. Uh, people still in the United States like technical solutions. Um, in terms of uh, Keystone, great question. Um, I contend, I'm, not, I'm in the minority, but you know, I spend a lot of time on these issues. I contend that the company that was gonna build Keystone Pipeline realized it was a non-commercial project now. And by that, what do I mean by that? You build a pipeline because you believe you're gonna have 20 to 30 years worth of business. You don't build a pipeline because there's demand for two years. And there is no investment going into the Canadian oil sands because it's an expensive resource and it was high carbon. Um, so I, I would argue that Keystone Pipeline was not needed. I agree with you that it was a political litmus test. You know, if I was a Democrat and I would say that something positive about Keystone, that was like killing my political career. And if I was a Republican, I had to say I wanted Keystone. Um, but the pipeline itself made no sense anymore. And, uh, and that really raises some interesting questions for Russia. Right, which is um, what is the outlook, the real outlook for gas? Um, you know, if you have a strong market for two years or five years uh, during the transition, does that justify? I understand the Russians have a new interesting idea to build an east west pipeline. In other words, a pipeline can go in either direction. Um, but the question really becomes for Arctic resources and so forth uh, what is the real appetite? to build new infrastructure today to service a market for not for three years, but to service a market for 20 to 25 years. And will you be able to raise finance? You know, what would that finance cost? Who is still willing to give money to build facilities that were gonna be paid off over a 20 year period? Because I think as time goes on, that's gonna be a harder and harder sell the bigger the project. Um, and the, especially going into it, the European market where the die is cast, um, and even the Chinese market where the die is cast, that we're going to have a strong effort to net zero. Thank you, Amy. And I think that's a perfect also uh, trigger for Dimitri's uh, net zero Russia uh, project. Um, Manfred, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, 
uh, Marc Antoine, and thank you, Professor Meyer Jaff, uh, for uh, the discussions. I am uh, indeed very happy that uh, Professor Meyer Jaff, who I'm sure knows the US much better than I, since I, I do not live in the US, has a more optimistic view on the US delivering on uh, its net zero uh, uh, plans by mid-century, including by delivering it uh, with non-technical instruments than uh, with pricing mechanisms as we, as I think. Uh, the, the, uh, in the chat, Johannes Ritter uh, asked uh, if uh, I share, if I think that uh, uh, it is possible for a multilateral approach in reaching out for cooperation regarding hydrogen imports, exports. My answer would be, I don't care. My answer would be, we, what I do care about is that A, we are all aware of uh, this huge challenge which we have, that we are not egoistic in the sense that we only care about ourselves today, but we care about uh, the future, our children, our grandchildren. We are aware that by not doing anything, it will cost us more than by addressing the issue today. And uh, uh, hydrogen is surely part of the solution, and we will need to import. Uh, uh, in Europe, for instance, we will need to import part of the hydrogen which we are not able to produce ourselves, and it does not make sense to produce all the hydrogen at home up to 2050, so we will need to import it from Russia, from the Middle East, from wherever. But if these uh, uh, imports are bilateral or multilateral, that's, uh, I don't care. The important thing is that we are all aware that we need to, we are in the same boat, and the producing countries, Russia and, and, uh, and the Middle East, I think, they also need to understand that the world is moving and that uh, the, if they want to continue to, uh, they have a certain business model, which we know, and which has worked quite fine so far, if we believe that the world is moving in the direction we are talking and that progressively we will all use less hydrocarbons. Uh, they also need to adapt to this new business model and maybe exporting hydrogen is one way of doing that. Of course, in the short term, we need to get rid of coal. So natural gas is welcome. We need natural gas and we need the Russian natural gas, of course. But in the very long run, we also have a problem with natural gas because unless we abate it, unless we we uh, adapt, we 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 convert it into hydrogen, which can be done in Europe or in Russia, or unless we use carbon capture, use and storage. Um, uh, uh, yeah, as of uh, the question of Marc Antoine, very briefly because I have to rush and we have to finish in any case. Uh, how can we cooperate on a global level? Um, I think uh, uh, CO2 pricing is one way we should cooperate. Uh, we are already starting discussing between Europe and China, strangely. Uh, uh, we are not discussing it with the, our American friends, strangely, even though uh, a pr price approaches is an American way of, of, of doing business in the old days, eh? and we have taken it over from there. So I, I wish and I, I hope we will one day be able to discuss it with our American friends as well as uh, with uh, the rest of, uh, of the world. We need, I think, to cooperate on uh, technology development in order to reach decarbonization. And I fully understand uh, Professor uh, Mayer Jeff's uh, concern, which she, I mean, it's not her concern necessarily, it's the concern of the American president. And I, and we also have the same thing in Europe. Uh, we still fully understand the national security issue and, and, uh, and making sure that we secure supply chains. This does not mean that we should not cooperate. And uh, the last thing I want to say, I am just troubled when we build up narratives and stories about country which are our, our enemies or we, we have problems with. Uh, uh, I think uh, this is not the way we're going to solve the big challenges of our world. I think we need to 
to find cooperation schemes. And I know it's more easily said than done, and I'm happy that time is over because it's complicated to elaborate on how to do it. Uh, uh, but, uh, but this is the way we need to work on, I think, and not saying, uh, this is my enemy, that is my enemy, we're not going to get anywhere with this approach. Thank you so much, and thank you for everybody, for those who have invited me to be with you. It was an exciting uh, uh, a workshop. I have learned a lot by our American friend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manfred. Uh, many thanks, Amy. Thanks to those uh, who raised questions. Um, and I uh, would like to pass the floor back to Dmitri uh, for his uh, closing uh, remarks. Thank you, Marc Antoine. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to, to thank uh, Professor Jaffe and Professor Hafner, and of course, Marc Antoine for his excellent uh, job as, as chair. Uh, well, fortunately, I was not chairing myself today, so I could enjoy uh, every minute uh, of, of this wonderful discussion. And I would like to thank the public, people who uh, managed to, to uh, join the seminar. And uh, I would like personally to thank Daniel Sutinsky and Arik Burakowski and Chris Miller, who also helped to, to make this wonderful event happen. So thank you once again. We will uh, have a break till September when we are, well, still think about events in Germany in a hybrid or uh, even, even offline mode. If not, we will meet again online and continue our wonderful quest for the future of energy. Thank you. Thank you once again. It was very good. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice day. Especially thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much.